test. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. It is such a gift to have you here worshiping with us today, whether you are uh, joining us online or whether you are gathered with us here in the sanctuary, um, whether you are here for the first time or the 1,000th time, it's just good to be together. So welcome. And it is our deepest hope that during your time um, with us that you would feel welcome, that you would know the welcome of those who are worshiping um, in this room with you, but that you would also know the welcome of God our Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who's always with us on this journey of life and faith. If you don't know me, my name is Hillary Downs, and I am one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church. I have the gift of serving in that role alongside Tom Abbott, and Tom and I, along with Liz, will all be leading in this time of worship today. A few things about our life together. While many of the things that we often have going on are taking a break for the summer months, uh, men's breakfast continues to meet on Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. At, at Romeo's, and Tom's Bible study that meets on Monday nights by Zoom will be meeting tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Um, all are welcome to that time. The link gets sent out in an email, and if you're not on the church email list and want to be, then um, make sure you connect with one of us so we can get that to you. 
Speaking of which, in the seat pockets that are there at the chairs, there's a little yellow card. And if you are somebody who is newer around here and you want to make sure that we have your contact information, you can fill that out and you can place that in the offering plate that's at the back of the sanctuary. Um, if you have been around a while, but maybe your contact information has changed, that little yellow card is also a good place to note that as well. Um, a number of you have asked me if our high school students are going to be selling peaches again this summer. And the answer is yes, of course, as far as I know. Um, I'm just waiting for confirmation from our orchard partner, um, and you all will get that information as soon as I get that information. Um, I want the peaches as much as you do. So um, as the school year is going to be starting soon, I hate to say that, um, and September isn't so far off, um, that means that a lot of different programs for youth and children and adults are going to be starting up um, in the weeks ahead. So I encourage you all to consider um, where and how you might want to participate in supporting and engaging in ministry. If you are looking for a way to be involved, there are lots of different kinds of opportunities, not just with children or youth, but all over the church. And so um, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Tom would be happy to talk with you about that. Um, but there's lots of great ways to get engaged. Finally, mark your calendars for Sunday, August 20th. That's still a few weeks away, but that will be our annual morning of worship in the park in Poncha Springs, where we will join together in worship along with our Methodist and Episcopal and First Christian Church congregations um, friends instead of gathering here. It's always a really sweet time um, of worship together. We have a picnic afterwards, potluck picnic afterwards. Um, so Sunday, August 20th. Keep that in mind. Well, as we shift our hearts and minds to worship, will you please pray with me? Holy Spirit, we welcome you to this place, to this time. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the gift of your friendship as you sit among us here. God of peace, fill us with the reassurance of your presence that we might have the courage to wrestle with your words to us today. Amen. Well, we are continuing our journey through the letter of James. And this morning we find ourselves in the second half of chapter 2. So let's listen to and for God's word to us as we find it in James chapter 2 beginning at verse 14. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together, hand in glove. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to stand as you are able um, as we sing our first hymn together this morning.
city of God, we are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly. with mine and let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this community, for the gift of time to gather together in worship. And Lord, as we have gathered here, we pray that you would knit us more and more together with one another as your people and deepen our roots, our connection with you. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, for those times when we have sought our own comfort over responding to your call upon our lives. When we have chosen anger instead of patience, when we have forgotten that all you are and that when we've forgotten all that you've done. Cleanse us, Lord. Make us new. Send us out to be your people who make a difference for your kingdom in this world. Startle us out of our comfort and complacency that we may jump with both feet into the new life that you offer us and that you desire for all of this world. Lord, make us alert to your presence with us as we worship and ready us to hear your word. Amen. And as we sing again our next hymn, uh, you can remain seated. Street. 
invite you to join your hearts with mine as we continue to read from James' letter to the church where Hillary left off. I'm going to start with, do I hear you professing, Pam? If you want to get there. So we're all on the same page. Do I hear you professing? Do you want to go to that, Pam? Yeah, so go to the next one. All right, right there at the bottom. You ready? Here we go. <clears throat> Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works and two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners, that faith expresses itself in works, that the works are works of faith? The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works? The same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot, wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works and you get the same thing, a corpse. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, if there's some kids who want to come join me up here today, that would be great. <clears throat> inside this thing. Batteries. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you mean it needs batteries? Uh-oh. There's a missing battery. No wonder it's not working. Hey, I must remember you. Well, let's see if we can get this thing to work, huh? Put the battery in. Wow. Try not to blind it. 
make it a star. Yes, <coughs> going half blind. Or yeah. So, isn't that amazing? So this only works if it has batteries. So a flashlight, a headlamp, it's not any good without batteries. And batteries aren't any good unless you put them in something that needs them, right? Yeah, they're, they work together in unison. And that's what the scripture is talking about today, that faith and works are just like that. They go hand in hand, they work together. One without the other isn't any good. You gotta have both. Just like you gotta have batteries to go with a flashlight, and you gotta have a flashlight to go with batteries. So as we think about living our life, we want to remember that faith and works go hand in hand. They work together. You guys pray with me? Gracious God, thanks for loving us. Thanks that we get to be together this morning. And we pray that you would help us to understand what it means that faith and works go hand in hand. That they, they need each other as we live our lives. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Bethany is here to teach Sunday school today, so you guys can go to Sunday school or the nursery, whatever you want to do, or you're always welcome to stay in here. So have a good morning. And let's stand and sing our next hymn. <laughs> Let them just stand. stand for our next hymn, number 762. This might be a new one for you. When the poor ones who have nothing share with angels, when the thirsty water gives unto us all, when the crippled in their weakness strength and others, then we know that God still goes that road with still goes that road with us when at last all those who suffer find their comfort when they hope though even hope seems hopelessness when we love though hate and time seems all around us then we know that God still goes that road with us. Then we know that God still goes that road with us. When our joy fills up our cup to overflowing, when our lips can speak no words other than true, when we know that love for simple things is better, then we know that God still goes that road with us. Then we know that God still goes that road with us. When our homes are filled with goodness in abundance, when we learn how to make peace instead of war, when each stranger that we meet is called a neighbor, then we know that God still goes that road with us. To go that road with us. You may be seated. When I was in high school, like many of my peers, 
I had a pretty refined ability to sniff out hypocrisy and then point it out. <laughs> Junior high or middle school beats most of us up in one way or another. And we discover people are not who we thought or that they have become someone different than we thought that they were. As we grow, our friendships change, and by the time we reach high school, we have usually discovered as well the imperfections of our very human parents. <laughs> it was no different for me. And then for me, there was also church, a place that I saw as all talk and no action. I thought it was a place full of fakers, people who claimed a belief that they didn't really live out. While the truth is that I really didn't know anything about the personal spiritual lives of the people who attended there, I was just rather judgy. I did, though, as I've shared here before, get caught in the middle of church politics, a term which ought to be an oxymoron. But I got caught in church politics when the senior pastor's ego felt threatened by how many people, particularly young people, were drawn to and were enjoying the presence of our gregarious and deeply faithful youth pastor. And that youth pastor was eventually asked to resign as a result. And it left many of us from our youth group reeling. In the midst of all that mess, one Sunday morning, our senior pastor preached on Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, where Jesus says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Hearing that senior pastor read those words and speak on them, I felt physically ill and so very angry. Because wasn't that pastor and much of the leadership doing exactly what Jesus warned them against? And they didn't even seem to notice. I wanted to stand up and leave. But instead, I stayed while tears streamed down my face all throughout that sermon. The hypocrisy of it all is seared in my brain and my heart. And while I love the Christian church in spite of its imperfections, I feel James's words very acutely here. And if what a person says or professes to believe does not match up with their actions, I don't have a lot of patience with or interest in that person. So depending on who you are, James's words sound either wonderful for the truth you hear or infuriating for the truth that they speak. But they are for sure words we all need to wrestle with. Because James is a pastor speaking to us all, who have each been found guilty here somewhere, whether it's in judging harshly instead of showing mercy, or leading with anger instead of listening, or whether it's that we've let public opinion influence how we live out our faith, or whether we've just gotten lazy and off track, really good at words and less good at the actual doing of those words. Here in chapter 2 of James, this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. In the end of chapter 1, James emphasized the need to be a good listener of God's word, allowing God's word to be cultivated in you by the Holy Spirit so that it takes deep root. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. Remember? 
But James quickly follows up by letting his readers know that as important as that listening and cultivating is, if it only sits there, it will soon become full of weeds. Faith without action, without deeds, James says, is dead, a corpse, to put it in the boldest and most graphic of terms. Those of us who grew up Presbyterian or in another Protestant tradition may be pausing here at James's words because didn't we learn from the Apostle Paul in another part of the New Testament that we are saved by grace alone and not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our own merit. Our salvation is all the work of God, right? We're supposed to stop striving to win God's affection, stop striving to win our way out of or away from hell, right? Didn't Jesus do all the work for us at the cross? Don't we know God's love because God has first loved us and through God's work on our hearts through the Holy Spirit, God has revealed all of this to us. If we say we believe, that's enough, right? That's what we were told. And yes, that's true. That's all true. We do not have to earn our way into heaven through good deeds. God is not keeping a naughty and nice list. But accepting the gift of grace we've been given in Jesus Christ the gift that we have been made right with God through Christ's death on the cross for our sin. Well, that's just the beginning of a journey of discipleship. Your choice to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ is not a get-out-of-hell-free card that you cash in when you die. It's a relationship with the God of the universe. And what James wants to know is how could it be that so many of us take that truth so lightly with so little care? Because do you realize how amazing that is? I have a little sign in my house that one of my nieces gave to me that says, how cool is it? that the same God who created mountains, oceans, and galaxies thought the world needed one of you, too. Yeah, that is pretty cool. And I hope that you know that those words are true for you also. But perhaps the problem that James is seeking to address is that too many people stop there basking in the glow of God's love for them and God's kindness and mercy and grace shown towards them, that they have forgotten, that they haven't only been invited into God's kingdom and given a seat at the table, they have also been charged to live as disciples of Jesus, following in his footsteps, doing as he did, so that others might know and experience and discover this truth and come to the table as well. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, follow me. And they did. Yes, they themselves were healed or restored and given new life and purpose. But they were also given a command to follow in his footsteps. And Jesus spent his time among the lowest and the least and the loveless of the world. He spent his time seeking to bring physical healing to people, curing their disease, both spiritual and physical, feeding those who didn't have enough, lifting up those who were at the lowest rungs of society and caring for them, advocating for them. Jesus' disciples went with him to those places, and they learned from him there. And what James is saying 
is that if you're really going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, then you're going to go to those places too. And you're going to get dirty. Things are going to get messy. Hands dirty kind of messy and messy with the mess of people not really liking what you're doing. Just like people were often uncomfortable with what Jesus was doing. Because Jesus was not afraid to go to the messiest of places to bring mercy without judgment, to bring tangible acts of assistance, to let those that empty religion had said are on the outside of grace know that God says something quite different about who they are. So we have to go to those places too. Even if it gets our hands dirty, even if it scares us when we realize it might put us at odds with the beliefs of others in our community or even with friends. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are not bound by all the Jewish laws that were thought to bring one into right relationship with God. But the Apostle Paul does also say, in Galatians chapter 5, that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, which is quite in line with James. James, however, isn't speaking to new believers as Paul was. James is speaking to believers who have been in the church for a while, kind of like a lot of us. And perhaps he doesn't want them to forget this piece from Paul, that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, that faith and works, works and faith, fit together hand in glove. A glove without a hand is lifeless, useless. And a glove with a hand in it can do so much more than a bare hand alone. It can go to much more challenging places, do much dirtier work. When our youth were in Guatemala back in June, laying block for the house we were helping to build and mixing mortar, if any of us ever forgot our gloves, we regretted it. Our hands would get torn up by the block, We'd get blisters from the shovels, or we simply couldn't touch the mortar without risking chemical burns from the cement on our hands. We needed our hands in gloves. So too, James says, if we try to do the work of the God of love without the enlivening and guiding spirit of God within us, we are going to end up battered and bruised. Our faith, our connection with God, and the work we do for God's kingdom cannot be separated. It's like hands in a glove. True religion, true faith, James says, takes action. And it seems to me as obvious as James says it is. We have a God who throughout the Old and New Testaments is a God of action who is on the move, constantly calling people back to himself, constantly seeking to work through people to set the world right once again and bring justice, Eden once again for all. And the for all includes all those that this world finds loveless. Why on earth would we think we don't need to be a part of that. Why on earth would we not want to? Or do we not really believe it? Our church, like many churches, has a vision statement. God's dream for the world, nothing less. And a mission statement, growing disciples of Jesus through knowing God, loving each other, and serving the world. And then we follow all of that up with, I think, 14 value statements. And if you've never seen them, 
They're on the bulletin board out in the hallway. Um, they're on a piece of paper on the table out in the hallway, or you can find them on our website as well. And I encourage you to check them out. To create such things is a little bit risky. We may have to actually strive to do them if we want to have the integrity of being who we say we are and not a bunch of fakers. And hopefully we do. But I think they're also a beautiful statement of our understanding of what it means, what it looks like for us. First Presbyterian Church of Salida, Colorado, when the rubber hits the road. When we really seek to live out a call from Jesus where faith and action are hand in glove. Do we do it all perfectly? Of course not. But that's where we need your help as part of the community of those here seeking to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Just as a few weeks ago in Guatemala, we could not build a house alone. We cannot build God's kingdom alone as individuals. Nor can we do it without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need each other. We need to be growing together. We need to be working together side by side, encouraging one another, cheering each other on, all of us enlivened by the Spirit as we seek to grow in our discipleship of Jesus. A discipleship that's going to get lived out in all kinds of ways. We are all different people. But it's risky, I know, and it's messy. But it's a way to a life more lively, more authentic than you can ever imagine. Amen. As Liz comes and plays for us, I just encourage you to take this time to not only listen to the beautiful music, but listen for what God is speaking to you. Amen.
confident that God hears us and knows our needs, let us pray for all of God's creation. Let us pray. Creator of beauty and surprising complexity, we long for the wisdom we need in order to cherish this earth. Give us the vision to see what you have made, vast expanses of prairie, forests dark and thick, oceans full of wondrous creatures, majestic mountains, life-giving streams, and the heavens bigger than our imaginations. Show us how to keep your gifts as good stewards. Liberator of the captive, you know the failings of the nations when we turn our friends and neighbors into enemies. Free our lands from despotic rules, rulers, tricksters, people who lie for personal gain, and those who wield hate speech. Give courage and perseverance to those who are weary of the struggles for justice so that new life and strength will infuse their tired bones. We ask that you would instill us with wisdom as we desire a faith that leads us to works, works that bring healing to your creation. Savior, we see the desperation of our sisters and brothers as well as ourselves. And knowing your love for what you have made, we beg your promises to be fulfilled. Waters in the desert, healing even in the time of death protection from whatever is frightening, salvation for those who are without help. Holy God, we pray for those who grow our food and keep our water clean, for politicians who make good laws and judges who rule with compassion, for children, for elders, for parents and grandparents, aunts, uncles, and friends and strangers. Give to your world the means to live in harmony. God of all salvation, we give thanks for your son who came to bring us life and taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to head out into the world, let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Live Into Hope.
come to the close of our time together this morning, I encourage you to seek to connect with one another, say hello to the person next to you, introduce yourself to somebody that you've never met, reintroduce yourself to somebody you've already met but you forgot their name. Um, be curious about one another, ask good questions, and let us remind one another that we are not alone, that we are not meant to go alone in this world. And as I mentioned earlier, our church's vision, mission, and values statements um, are posted out in the hallway. And I encourage you to take time to look through those values today, take them home with you, go through them during the week, and consider where you want to get your hands dirty to help us better live into who we desire to be as a church, as a community, serving God in God's kingdom, that we might better as a church live into our mission of seeing God's dream for the world become a reality. So please join with me in our unison benediction up on the screen. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe it and go in God's grace and power. Peace of Christ be with you. Thank you for being here today.